Hi, it's Professor Bernstein, and I want to welcome you to the Art of Summarization. Summaries of nonfiction works, that is, articles, essays, chapters, or books, usually describe the author's thesis and some of the key points she makes to support her claim. Summaries of fictional works, short stories, novels, movies, or plays, usually describe the theme, the conflicts between and within the main characters, and the resolution of these conflicts. The main goal is to give the reader or listener a strong overall sense of the text. Now, summaries sound really basic, and some ways they are. After all, you're not coming up with your own argument, you're just presenting someone else's basic ideas. But you know what? It's really not that easy to summarize. Let me tell you a story about one of my own experiences with writing a particular type of summary. Um, I'm going to talk about when I used to write the back cover copy for Harlequin romance novels. So one of my more recent tasks was to write the copy for, for a 200-page romance novel called Shotgun Bride. I had to summarize and sell the book in about 120 words. Here is what I wound up writing. Handsome as sin and wild as the western wind. That's the Corbett brothers for you. And Shane's no exception. No way is he settling down just because of some ridiculous marriage pact, especially not with a cowgirl from small town Montana who seems so young, so innocent, so downright naive. At least that's what this hardened Texas Ranger keeps insisting. But when Maddie Cavanaugh is kidnapped and drawn into a world of violent greed and despair, Shane jumps right into action. Subduing her captors was going to be difficult, but resisting the force of Maddie's charm was turning out to be even harder. Was stubborn Shane going to be the first of the Corbett boys to finally surrender his bachelorhood? How long do you think it took me to write that? It took me more than five hours to write that copy because I had to spend time figuring out what actually happened in the story, what the hero's conflict with the heroine was, and how the problem got resolved. And for me, really one of the trickiest parts of writing a summary is figuring out what information to leave out and what information to put in. Because what happens is you read a text that's full of all these details, and then you have to condense it. In this case, I had to reduce a 60,000 word novel to a 120 word summary that also managed to help sell the book. This is a real challenge. You have to take all this information and figure out how to transform it into a concise, simple, and coherent narrative. So let's go over two other facts about summaries. First off, number four, summaries must be able to stand on their own and make sense to someone who has not yet read the text. And five, summaries need to be concise. They need to be relatively short. Now, knowing how to effectively summarize is really important for writing good papers. And when I first started teaching composition, I didn't assign summaries. For some reason, I thought we just had to jump right into writing arguments. But over time, I came to realize that one of the reasons why many of my students struggled with their persuasive essays was because they didn't know how to set up or summarize the ideas of others. So this skill is helpful when you're writing not just summaries, but when you're writing also longer, more persuasive essays. But it goes beyond the classroom. If you develop the abil your ability to summarize material, you'll also have an easier time remembering readings, lectures, discussions, and meetings. So it's not just about writing papers. It's also helping you develop um, your skills as a learner. Your mind will get in the habit of distinguishing main points from secondary ones. And if you practice enough, you'll have an easier time synthesizing. You'll, that is, you'll have an easier time bringing together bits of information and organizing them into a coherent whole. 
And when you get into the habit of summarizing what you're reading, listening to, and, wa and watching, you'll also start realizing what you are and are not understanding. If you realize right after class that you didn't fully understand a concept the teacher was teaching, you can ask her about it at the beginning of the next class, class session or during her office hours. So you don't have to wait until the night before an exam to realize you don't understand something and then freak out or bomb a question or the test itself. You can use a similar approach in your professional life. For instance, if someone gives you a fairly complex task, you can take a moment to say, okay, so you're saying that you'd like me to accomplish X, Y, and Z before starting to write up the report, and then you'd like Maya to review the draft of the report and sign off on it. And this approach, what this approach does is make sure you fully understood what you're told so that you can then act independently and successfully. So now I want to get into the five basic rules for writing good summaries. One, in the first sentence, you need to state the title of the text, the author's name, and the thesis or theme. So here's an example. In Woman on the Moon, Mary Dexter argues that the government should spend more money training women to become astronauts. Two, don't take sides or state your opinion. Stick to the information presented in the text. So here's an example. Dexter observes that many girls are not encouraged to take risks and engage in physically daring activities. So that would be an example of sticking to Dexter's ideas. The next example is wrong. Dexter's claim that girls are not encouraged to engage in physical, physically daring activities is wrong. And the problem here, you know, the Dexter might be wrong, but when you're writing a summary, that's not the place to take sides or state your opinions or judge the text. You are just stating what is being said in this particular text. Three, use the present tense. So here's an example. Dexter claims that Dexter points out that talking about Dexter and this essay in the present tense. The second example is incorrect because the writer is referring to Dexter in the past tense, saying Dexter claimed that. Four, remind the reader that you are discussing your source's thoughts not your own. So here's an example from Diana Hacker's A Writer's Reference. This is um, a sample summary that she takes, that she gives in her book. In her essay, Big Box Stores Are Bad for Main Street, Betsy Taylor argues that chain stores harm communities by taking the life out of downtown shopping districts. Explaining that a community's soul is more important than low prices or consumer convenience, she argues that small businesses are better than st stores like Walmart, Target, and Home Depot because they emphasize personal interactions and don't place demands on, communi on a community's resources. Taylor asserts that big box stores are successful because we've become a nation of hyper-consumers. So the blue text, you'll notice, is how the writer of this summary helps the reader see that the ideas being presented here are Taylor's ideas. Taylor argues. She argues. Taylor asserts. So you're always reminding the reader that you're talking about your source's thoughts, not your own. A problematic example comes at the bottom of the page. A community soul is more important than low prices. Small businesses are better than stores like Walmart. The problem here is that this writer is presenting these ideas as if they are her own, and they're not. Five, tell readers in your own words what the text is about and use use quotes sparingly. 
As you know, if you take a phrase or sentence directly from the text, you must put quotation marks around it. If you use a quote, you must put the page number in parentheses at the end of the sentence. So let me give you an example. Taylor asserts that big box stores are successful because we've become a nation of hyper consumers. That's an example of using the direct quote properly. Um, and the writer chose to use this quote because it was very powerful phrasing. And it's just one of maybe one or two quotes in the entire summary. What is problematic is the second example. Taylor talks about how we're a nation of hyper consumers. Uh, this is problematic because you're taking that phrasing nation of hyper consumers and not giving ta uh, giving Taylor credit for coming up with that phrase. So this goes back to the issues about plagiarism that we've been talking about. So um, now you know these five rules for writing summaries. I want to point out some excellent power verbs that you can use when you are giving your source credit, when you're mentioning what your source is doing in his or her text. So I'm not going to read them all to you right now, but you should take a few minutes to write down all of these verbs so that you have them in your own notebook that you can refer to when you're writing your papers. So that's it. This is Professor Bernstein, and I'll see you in the next video.